Welcome to IC Singapore. Thanks be to God. Today we can meet again in our online Sunday service. For six months, we have been doing online Sunday service, and I am sure we are longing to be able to meet again and worship together at church. Even so, 
we need to be grateful because we still have a chance to praise God and learn from His Word. Let us continue to pray for God's mercy so that the COVID-19 pandemic can be settled sooner. Today we come to the final topic in our Soul Detox Sermon Series. Grief and sorrow are a part of our lives and believers are no exception. Often the sorrow and grief affects our lives, not only physically or psychologically, but also our life of faith. Today we will learn from God's Word that will help and strengthen us when we face grief and sorrow. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, verse 18. Let us prepare ourselves to begin our worship. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, thank God that we can worship together again. Psalm 136 reminds us that God's love endures through everything. It says that He remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. So give thanks to the God of heavens. His love endures forever. Let us rise and praise Him. Yeah. 
Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Because of your love, you came down to this world, suffered and died for us, to save us from eternal condemnation. We are sorry if we often take your love and sacrifices for granted. Remind us today that in the midst of storm or green pastures, you are always with us and will always love us. By your Holy Spirit, teach us to obey you and to trust you in the darkest of times and in the best of times. We continue to pray in the midst of this pandemic. We are grateful for the wisdom you've given to our government. We are thankful that the COVID cases in Singapore have gone down. We pray that you will continue to give strength and wisdom to our decision makers and medical workers in their fight against COVID-19. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help our scientists in their pursuit of the COVID vaccine that will help save many lives. We trust that even in these trying times, there are still many blessings that we can be grateful for. Help our eyes to see them with faith. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters. We ask for healing for those who are sick, for peace for those who are anxious or stressed from having to face their exams. We ask for strength for those who work, for wisdom, for those who lovingly raise their kids to fear you, assurance for those who face uncertainties in life, and comfort for those who are grieving. Help us to care for one another with godly love. As we continue to worship you, may you fill us with the warmth of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort amongst true Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you your patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. As another month goes by in 2020, some of us might be overwhelmed by what is happening. We might have hope that things will get better quickly, but it doesn't happen the way we wanted it to be. And after some time, some of us might just feel helpless, hopeless, and worse still, numb. From our scripture reading, let us be reminded that we can always find comfort in God's everlasting arms that will carry us through all the seasons in our lives.
rise and now confess our faith together. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. In these uncertain times, it is not hard to stay strong in our faith. Some of us might not feel totally helpless, but we feel frustrated and restless. All the plans we have made had to be cancelled, and we try to do everything to take control of our lives again, but we just can't do it. We can, however, be still and surrender ourselves fully to God, knowing that He has beautiful plans with our lives. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief for me. Live to thy God. To order and provide in every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Still my soul, thy God doth undertake To guide the future as he has the past Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake All now mysterious shall be bright and last
hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord when disappointment grief and fear are gone sorrow for God love's purest joys restored be still my soul when change and fears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall be at last. Hi, good morning. Today we'll talk about the living in the reality of Christ's second coming. Now have you watched uh, a movie lately? There's some movies with really lousy endings that make you go, wow, you know, that's terrible, I just wasted my money. Maybe you will make the self-comforting remarks, at least the effects, the special effects were good, the animation was good, uh, even though there is virtually no plot. You know, others, other movies have cliffhangers. They have cliffhangers as ending, exciting, suspense feel, uh, waiting for you to want more, uh, you know, for what comes next. And then there are movies with happy endings, uh, even good sequels like The Lord of the Rings or The Avengers, the, you know, Infinity War saga um, has some sort of a happy ending of some sort. I think this is human nature. I don't know about you, but I like happy endings. We need happy endings. As one psychologist wrote, most of us probably agree that we like uh, the movies we watch or the plays we attend to end well. We want to know what happened, why, and when possible. We like a sense of what will happen to the characters next. We like resolution. We, uh, will they live happily ever after? But when all manner of things is not well, when meaning is not apparent or not there to be had, we are in a word discomforted and we want no, we need closure. Everyone likes a happy ending. We know it. God knows it. He made, he made us that way, and closure is what He gives us. Now, in biblical revelation, God tells us His story, which is also our story. It's the story of creation, the story of God's creation, and we as His special creatures, mankind. He tells the story of a good creation, and yet how we fell, we made it wrong. And then for the rest of the Bible, he's going to demonstrate how is he going to make it right again through Jesus Christ, of course. And he tells us to live in the present, but also for the future. And that is what the Thessalonians Christians were all about. First Thessalonians is very much about the second coming, a lot of it. Of course, it has other themes as well, like being imitators of uh, Christ and Paul. But one of the main themes is the second coming, the resurrection. First Thessalonians, the Christian life is grounded in the second coming. So let's do a survey of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians before we go into our text for today. So let's explore the importance of Christ's return in this whole makeup. The first thing we want to see is that prayer is grounded in Christ's return. We give thanks to God always for all of you. This is Paul and, uh, you know, responding to answer prayer. He's praising God. He's thanking God. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope um, in our Lord Jesus. Uh, why does Paul give thanks? Obviously, you're giving thanks to something that you prayed for, right? You got something that you want. And basically what he gives thanks for and prays for shows us what he really wants. And that's a way of basically correcting the, the things that we want to pray for and ask for. We look at Paul as an example. We want to imitate him. So Paul gives thanks because he heard reports of their active faith. He knows that their faith is for real. He remembers their work of faith, uh, work that comes from their faith. Uh, Paul knows like James knows that faith uh, that is not active is not a living faith, is not a real faith. In other words, it's a fake faith. Just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, faith is never alone. Faith is accompanied by love, okay? And, and love is not the action. It is not sacrifice. Love is the thing that comes from within that produces sacrifice. So in the same way, faith accompanies love. And so does hope. So that's why these people are steadfast in hope. And that's why he's praising God for it. And hope is basically the, the, one of the main themes in the whole of 1 Thessalonians. A faith without love is an empty love. Just as 1 Corinthians tells us, in the same way, a faith without hope is a hopeless one. 
God does not leave us, leave us with a cliffhanger. He gives us a happy ending, a powerful ending. And this is not one of those endings which we have great string music and uh, nice drums and timpanis in the background. And, you know, it makes you, it pulls your heartstrings. It's not one of those. But uh, the victorious and powerful ending um, can only reside in our hearts because the Holy Spirit is showing that to us. It's only by Holy Spirit power that we could appreciate and feel the triumphant strength of, um, you know, uh, the second coming of Christ. So this second coming, this resurrection, is an ending that is anchored in the resurrection of Christ. So the first resurrection is the starting point, and the ending point is the second resurrection, our resurrection. So this ending is anchored in the resurrection of Christ and yet climaxes in our resurrection by Christ. This is why Paul is rejoicing and giving thanks. For they themselves, talking about um, uh, the, the apostle friends of his, his apostolic emissaries, he says, For they themselves report how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul wasn't praising God because somebody got a job. He wasn't praising God because somebody got a promotion or a place in a university or somebody gets healed from a disease. I mean, those things are prayed for, but you know, that's not his main thrust. His main thrust is always resurrection, is always sanctification. If you read Paul's letters and you will see how Paul is always, always giving thanks about their, you know, connection to Christ and their holy lives and then the kingdom to come. It is the main, main thing that Paul prays for and gives praises for. How they are transformed and how they look forward to Christ's coming. How they wait for his son Jesus, the one who delivers us. The one who delivers us for himself. Now, of course, you may be asking, what do I mean by delivers us from him, for himself? Well, in the Greek, uh, the Greek is written in such a way that the delivering is for himself. You know, uh, it's, it's in what we call the, the middle uh, voice. It does not ultimate, he does not do this ultimately for our sakes, but for his own sake. And we get the benefits out of it. So this is the level of certainty that we have. Everywhere in the New Testament, God seeks his glory and delivering us is part of that glory. That means our resurrection at the end and our delivering us, uh, Jesus delivering us from the wrath of God, all this is for His glory. So it's a sure thing because God wants His glory. Because if He doesn't deliver us, He doesn't get His glory. So we are sure and certain. And notice something very important. The question is why do we serve God? Where do we get the power? On what grounds do we serve Him? Well, obedience is grounded in Christ's return. Uh, here he says that the basis of serving God is waiting for the Son, right? Uh, when his Son returns, we get resurrected. We're not to keep our eyes on the suffering Jesus, as some would do, but we're to keep our eyes on the King Jesus who will reign with power and to bring justice upon the earth. And that is what Paul prays for. In chapter 1, he gives thanks for their faith. He gives thanks for their hope and love. In chapter 3, he shows us what he's constantly praying for what's constantly on his mind and he gives thanks to what he asks for as a result of it and here he says in chapter 3 now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints so this is a prayer okay this is a prayer it is always about the coming of the lord jesus a new life will begin when jesus comes into sinless eternity right we're going to have this eternal life with god forever but for this current timeline our history our history all history ends with the coming of the lord jesus you see god doesn't provide in the old and new testament very much about what's heaven going to be like, what the new heaven and earth is going to be like. He says there is, but he's not going to describe very much. However, he gives us a lot of information on the return of Christ, the judgment, the restoration, and everything that's going on um, here in this uh, end of history. So he has a reason for that. And I think the reason is that he doesn't want us to speculate what's ahead, but to focus on the event, the main event, which is the coming of Christ. Now, the other thing that we see and that we should be looking forward to is Christ's return and the reason uh, why we are living faithfully, why we're obeying at all, is because of Christ's return. So he says here, 
We exhort each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So what does Paul mean when he says kingdom? For a start, he doesn't use the word too many times, right? But when he does use it, it is always for a few things. The first thing is that Christ is the king of his kingdom, the king of his kingdom. So when we wait for him, we're waiting for the king of the kingdom. He's not some pushover. He's not some weakling. He's not just some semi-powerful person. He is the king. And he's not just the king. He is the king of the only kingdom in the whole universe, right? The king of the whole earth. So we're waiting for the ruler of God's kingdom. So we're not waiting for someone weak. The second thing is that when Paul uses the word kingdom, the word the, the kingdom is in two parts. It has a now aspect, it's a current aspect, but at the same time, it has a future aspect. So like earlier in 1 Timothy 1, 9, we saw how Jesus will deliver us for himself. And the word delivers is written in the present uh, continuous tense, which means that the delivering is happening right now. He's not going to only deliver us at the end. He's delivering us right now. He's giving us that transformed life. And part of that is that delivering that he's talking about that will continue all the way to the end. So he doesn't leave us alone. As Jesus says, he will be with us to the end of the age. He's preserving us and keeping us to the end. So the present and the future is one continuous timeline. Uh, to put it in movie terms or science fiction terms, there is no alternate future. In God's mind, there's only one to end, and He will bring it about. There is no other ending. His kingdom must come, and His will must be done, both on earth as it is in heaven, both in the physical as well as the invisible realm. The word glory in this verse, if you see glory at the end of the verse, is talking about this future aspect. So they are grammatically tied in the Greek. The future kingdom is the glory. So yes, we are living right now in the kingdom. And we are to walk in a manner worthy of God. We are citizens of this he heavenly kingdom right now. But it's the same kingdom that Jesus will complete when he returns. So this is just part one of the kingdom. The fulfillment, the, 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 the completion, the consummation is when Jesus returns. So the way we live is grounded in the past event of uh, resurrection, our union with Christ. We are saved by Him. That is why we live for Him. However, the way we live, the power of why we live, is also based on the certain future to come, the sure future to come. We don't just live because of Christ's resurrection in the past. We live because also for His return. Because He's resurrected, that is proof that He will come back and resurrect us. It's always connected. So the resurrection should not be seen in isolation. Paul, um, as, as Dr. Kara says Paul is adding encouragement to walk in a manner worthy of God in that the God who calls us to future glory will also call and enable us to live for him now. So I go back to the point I made in the start. First Thessalonians is not directed at the false Christians, not directed at, at, at the hypocrite. It's not directed at the person whose faith does not produce work. Uh, they labor in love. They work out their love. They work out their faith, all right? And they are steadfast in hope. Um, so the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians is not talking about the casual churchgoer who lives in his own private space and does not labor in love. Most probably, these guys are, you know, under some sort of persecution. Um, those who think that they are loving because they gave up a few things to Christ are not laboring in love. He speaks to those who stores up treasures in heaven, who deny themselves, who give up the world so as to gain their own soul. This is the kind of real believer that Jesus says is worthy of the kingdom of heaven. One who sells everything for that thing, the pearl, the land, or whatever. He is the one who lives not for this current world, but the future glory to come. So we must not look at the passages, uh, the passage that we're looking at, in con uh, without the context of the whole book. We should not make assumptions without studying the main themes of the book. It is on this ground, this, this second coming is the important thing, uh, that we come to the text that we are supposed to look at today. But we do want you to be informed uh, we do not want you to be uninformed. We do want you to be informed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Simply put, the dead will rise again. The passage is all about the resurrection. The main feature of this passage is the word rose, rise, raised, or live again. 
Paul is saying, don't grieve if a true believer dies. He has showed us that a true believer is one who lives for Christ with faith, love, and hope. He's saying, don't be like the one who has no hope, which we would see uh, in the paragraph later. Uh, the fact Paul wants us to cling on is that Jesus will come and he will resurrect us, dead or alive. We are here, he will resurrect us. We are dead, he will resurrect us. He shows us that those who grieve have no hope. Okay, this is a harsh truth that people don't like to hear. For a believer, God says, don't grieve. But I think he means that you may grieve for an unbeliever because you'll forever be separated. Yet for the believer, God says, don't grieve. To grieve for a while is good. But to grieve for a long time is sin. Some Christians grieve for decades after a family, apparently Christian, family members die. You, you cannot claim to be Christian and grieve endlessly. On one hand, it might be because um, the person is not happy or angry that God took this brother or sister away from him. And um, God has the right to take life. He owns life. And he has the right to take his children back to heaven. And we shouldn't be grieving because that just means we are dissatisfied with God. And, and, and that's not right. So, um, but by endless grieving, the other thing is that we are rejecting the promise of God towards resurrection. He says, don't grieve because there's a resurrection, and we grieve. That's wrong. God says death for the Christian is only falling asleep. What do you tell the loved one um, who is going to sleep? When you put your kid to bed at night, what do you tell um, your, your child? Do you say goodbye? Do you say farewell? No, you say goodnight, see you in the morning, right? That's what Jesus told his disciples. I told you I'm going to rise again. Why are you crying? Why are you grieving? Don't grieve, you know, I'm here. So, in the same way, he says those of us who believe and those of us who believe in the coming will be blessed. So, we don't grieve. Ask God to give you power from the bottom of your heart to say, good night, see you in the morning. Paul says, don't be uninformed, or a better way to translate it is, don't be ignorant. He's saying, understand this, they are only asleep, right? God will wake them up just as he woke Jesus up three days later. He dare sleep, have faith, say good night, see you in the morning. But how is he going to do that? How how did uh, how is Jesus? How is God going to wake up uh, wake us up uh, at the end? So we come to the next part. Uh, we are raised to be with the Lord forever. So there's a great event. For this, we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Every believer must look forward to this great event. Those who are physically dead would be raised first. Then those who are still around and remaining and alive will be raised next. All this will happen in one event. Uh, the, uh, that's what it sounds here. The command through the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpets. Now what is this trumpet? Real trumpets were used in the Old Testament, and they are used for two main purposes. The first one is military use, the second one is ritual, religious use. Uh, we're, sh we're not sure if it's going to be a real trumpet, but that's not the, 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 what matters. What's important is that what the trumpet represents. It represents both religious and military. I think they're both used here. The spiritual and the physical realm will join. Heaven will be on earth. So the restoration is both spiritual and physical, just as Eden was both spiritual and physical. God walked among them and talked to them like friends. So Revelations tells us that Christ will bring war to rebels. He will destroy his enemies with his word that is coming. And I'm not going to talk about the different views that many different Christians would think of here, but just what this text is saying. Uh, there is something physical about this, but at the same time, everything in Christ's kingdom is spiritual. And the focus of this passage is the resurrection. And the resurrection is a physical resurrection, but in every sense, it is also spiritual. So his kingdom is always both spiritual and physical, just like Jesus, just like our resurrection bodies, physical and spiritual. And there is nothing that is not religious. Obeying the laws of the kingdom as a citizen is religious, but at the same time, also patriotic, something national, something, um, you know, patriotic and, and God says live in a manner worthy of Christ right to be godly uh, in the kingdom of God is to be um, obedient is to be spiritual is to be living as a walking spiritual uh, living sacrifice to be a spiritual worship as Romans tells us so um, there is nothing not religious 
Obeying the laws of the kingdom as a citizen is religious and at the same time national. So here's the order again. Uh, race instantly to his presence. The dead will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. The ones who are asleep, namely the ones who are dead in Christ, are contrasted with the ones who don't have hope, right? Those who are not in Christ. So not all the dead, but the dead in Christ is the reference here. They shall rise first. Then the ones who are alive, the ones who have not died, they who are still physically around will be raised next. So they will be raised, they will be caught up. That's the word caught up. What, what does the word caught up mean? Um, you can translate it a different way. It means snatched away, right, or seized. Uh, I think it's emphasizing the speed of the resurrection, the instantaneousness of the resurrection. Just before verse 17, at the end of verse 16, we read, <coughs> excuse me, the dead in Christ will, first, will rise first. So obviously the second group will be raised too. Right? So you'll be asking, the dead in Christ will rise first, okay, then who's going to rise next? Right? So the second group will be raised too. So raising and being snatched away talks about the same resurrection. They're parallels. So he's just showing you the speed of that raising. Paul's focus is the transformation, not the way the resurrection is going to happen. Okay, then we might ask, what about in the clouds? Is that a physical cloud thing? I think, you know, it's also in a way figurative. Jesus is said to come in clouds. Okay, it, you know, it's not like he's going to ride on a crowd, cloud. It doesn't look that way. Clouds always accompany power and glory. Cloud in the Old Testament mostly referred to the presence of God. Maybe he will, you know, come with that cloud because in the Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Lord, Yahweh, appears as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. So this is a manifestation. It's his appearance of, of God. It's how he looks to us, you know, his presence is just a symbol of his presence. So cloud in Old Testament mostly refers to the presence of God. God appears as a cloud. It is a visual indicator of his presence. Now the other word is air, right? They are to meet the Lord in the air. So what does Paul mean by that? Paul uses the word four times, air, two times in 1 Corinthians. Uh, he's referring to the empty space in front of him. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, you know, my Christian life is like, you know, like a boxer. So it's like he's describing. So I'm not punching in the air. I'm punching someone, right? So he's saying my Christian life is not aimless. In the same way, 1 Corinthians 14.9 says that if you speak in tongues in another language and nobody understands you, then you're talking aimlessly, pointlessly. Nobody's going to get it. So obviously, this cannot be the use of air here in 1 Thessalonians. This is descriptive of the space in front of them, and it's talking about aimlessness. So aimlessness is not the picture here. The other two times, one's found in 1 Thessalonians 4, the other one is found in Ephesians 2.2. In Ephesians 2.2, he refers to uh, Satan as the ruler of the air. There, the word air is like a figure of speech. It is a, a Greek way of describing everything in between physical objects. So you can have your mountains, you can have your buildings, you can have your, your sea, and everything in between is air. So the sense is that there is nowhere in this godless world system that Satan does not rule, the sense in Ephesians 2. So air refers to the, the rule, specifically how comprehensive his rule is. There is no part that escapes Satan's influence. So I think that's the, the way it is used here in 1 Thessalonians. Air is his influence, his power. So in short, caught up emphasizes the instantaneousness of his resurrection. The clouds refer to his presence, and finally the air refers to his rule. Basically talking about the same thing. So put together, it simply means that the dead will rise first, and, the, and, the, and instantly the living will be raised too, and both groups will enter his presence and his rule forever and ever. And this matches the description of 1 Corinthians 15. We shall not uh, all sleep. This is the resurrection passage. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. The focus is changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. The emphasis here in 1 Thessalonians is both instant immortality. The structure of our 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, 13 to 18, the text, especially from 15 to 17, says that the central message is resurrection. The instantaneous end of death is what resurrection is pointing to. So we become indestructible and immortal. Death is the final enemy. Uh, that's what Paul says. That's what Jesus says. The new body indicates the perpetual absence of death. No more death. We will be indestructible and immortal at the resurrection. 
instantaneously. We will always be in His presence and always be under His rule forever and ever. Now, I want to say something here. This, all this talk about the second coming and the resurrection um, is something that is in the future. We need faith to see it. And if we don't, it sounds like fairy tale, especially to modern you know, scientific people. Uh, but Paul and the New Testament authors take it very seriously, not because they're not modern, uh, modern, but because they take God's word seriously. Preachers should not stop emphasizing this. We don't live for this world. We are looking towards the second coming. The second coming is real. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. So we look forward to this hope, this hope of the real second coming. In fact, in Acts 17, Paul tells us that Christ's resurrection is a proof, a historical proof for a coming historical judgment, right? So the second coming is the very motivation of living a God-motivated, gospel-empowered, Christ-honoring life. It is the power to live godly lives. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The basis of an energized Christian life is the resurrection. The text says, nothing about reconciling with non-believing family members or friends. It makes it very clear that those who die in the Lord don't have any hope, right? Of course, you may say this passage then talks about reconciling with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, I would say you can infer that, but that's not the main thing that we're talking about. The main point in this passage is that Christ will come in power and will be resurrected. So yes, maybe you miss the people who are Christians and they died, but the focus is still second coming. The focus is Jesus. The excitement is Jesus not meeting your dead relatives, right? So the focus here is to keep our eyes on Jesus. If we are grieving, we keep our eyes on Jesus, okay? That's, that's the main thing. The purpose, of, uh, the, the, the purpose of the passage is about keeping our eyes on Jesus. That is the encouragement. Um, and you can see here in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, um, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. So the segment that is our text, 413 to 18, is an encouragement, and it's part of a bigger context that begins here in verse 1 uh, and goes all the way to verse 12. So application must not come from ourselves. It must come from what the context says. And context is sanctification. It is about pleasing God, living holy lives, living worthy lives, uh, worthy of the gospel of Christ, uh, the gospel of God. Uh, the purpose of being steadfast in love, the purpose of looking forward to the resurrection is so that we can live a life pleasing to God. That's Paul's aim, to show us that our power is planted in future glory. Uh, people who died with that hope, people who live holy lives, they will be raised to life. Right? So, the unrighteous will always get uh, their just desserts. The bad guys would always die at the end of the story. In the same way, God's enemy, enemies will be put in their place when Christ returns. As for those who love the Lord and His coming, those are the ones we don't grieve over after they die. Um, these are the ones, if, if, if a Christian has died and you know he's a true believer, then these are the ones who would have a happy ending. These are the ones we would say, good night, see you in the morning when Christ returns.
He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Brothers and sisters, as we end our service today and go back to our daily life, let us stand firm in our faith and cling to this promise of God until Jesus returns and call us home.
us stand. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thankful for you are always beside us in every circumstance. Omnipresence and omniscience, God, you know our hearts and our mental condition. You know the secret of our heart. Lord, help us to deal with our sorrow and grief. Remind us not to lose hope or become drowning in it, but can stand again and have hope. Because in you, we can face tomorrow. As the book of Proverbs remind us, there is surely a future hope for us, and our hope will not be cut off. As we give this offering as our faith to you, may you provide our daily need and our spiritual need. As the Bible says, a bruise reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Now, we ask for your blessing. May the love of the Heavenly Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all from now and forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday and God bless you all. Amen.